Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range technical forecast video brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. Now, in this particular video, I'm going to first go through the next 30 days or so, and then what we're going to do is give our preliminary winter outlook. So I've got some good stuff for you at the very end here. But looking back over the beginning of October, it's quite a lot different than it was a year ago, especially with respect to temperatures. The map on the left shows the first 13 days of October when you compare them to the 128 year record and the one on the right shows what things look like in 2019. In 2019 we had a very active storm track that came right here through the midsection of the country which made it extremely wet whereas in 2020 we featured more ridging into the western part of the United States and at times some cooler shots of air that have come through the Midwest. It's also been kind of punctuated though with a few brief warm-ups uh, that have lasted through the Midwest as well. So given this as a backdrop let's get right on into some of the near-term things we have to be discussing. Because over the last 30 days, uh, it's been very dry from parts of the southwest clear to the Great Lakes and northeast. Of course, we've discussed quite a bit about the multiple tropical systems that have cut through the southeast, putting down in some places between 300 and 1,000 percent of normal precipitation. Uh, but if you look back in the southern plains of the United States, this is an area that I'm very concerned about, given how dry that it has been here. And what I start to worry about here is as the pattern develops through fall and into winter, if we don't start returning moisture into this area, this could be something we'll be watching again next spring because drought in this region can be multi-seasonal, whereas it's much dip more difficult to do that, for example, in parts of the central Corn Belt over toward the east or the southeast. You can also see how wet things have been in the Pacific Northwest, but California, which normally has the beginning of its dry season starting in uh, the beginning of October, has not seen a drop, and it doesn't look like they're going to be seeing much here over the next at least week, probably beyond that. So looking over the next 10 days, we're going to be watching as a deep trough develops right in central Canada, several little what we call clipper systems that kind of run through just like this. There'll be one going in that direction uh, here over the next few days, bringing in some chances for some light precipitation uh, right here along the U.S.-Canada border. We're then going to watch the cold front of that probably sneak through on Thursday, bringing in some rainfall in through this area, and then push into the day uh, toward the end of the week on Friday here, cutting back from parts of like Pennsylvania, West Virginia, through the Appalachian Mountains, even back toward Texas. But there are going to be some pockets where we're going to be dry, as you can see here. We are watching a coastal low run up here. Uh, the East Coast could be quite powerful, bringing and some very strong winds uh, with this particular setup. But from here, what I want to do is I want to take you out to the day four through day 10 time period. So it's that second uh, seven day time period starting uh, after day four. And what we're going to be paying close attention to will be two things. So first of all, we're going to have another low that kind of clips in through this direction. But behind it, higher atmospheric pressure is going to build in here and here along the East Coast. Now remember, flow around high pressure centers in the Northern Hemisphere is clockwise. So the flow is going to go around just like this. And therefore, in between the two, right in through this area, there's going to be a stationary boundary. And along that boundary, from parts of Oklahoma through eastern Kansas, uh, then getting into Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, I'm going to be on the lookout here for better chances of heavier precipitation. And as this next low, the first arrow I drew, comes through, we got to be talking, start talking about snow into this area. So let's at least take a quick, quick look at that. I'm going to take you all the way out to next Thursday morning and show you between now on Wednesday and next Thursday what the probability is of getting a, a, an inch of snowfall. And you can see that in parts of Montana stretching into Wyoming and then parts of western uh, South Dakota, uh, western Nebraska, and, and uh, this section right in through here has a good chance at seeing that. And some of the models are trying to bring a, a band of snow cutting right in through this area, but that's too much, uh, it's bouncing around too much in the operational models to be clear on. But as you can tell with this deep trough, I'll put an L in it right here, this deep trough developing in the midsection here of Canada, right really over parts of Saskatchewan and Manitoba, which is where I put the L, uh, we could be on the lookout here for some pretty cold air to be coming in behind each one of these little systems that runs through the northern plains. By the time we stretch it out to day 10, we can see the pattern is, is still remained in this blocked up fashion with a larger ridge that's sitting here into the Gulf of Alaska, one that's in parts of the uh, North Atlantic over there by uh, North America with a deep downstream trough that's cutting into Europe, but generally higher atmospheric pressure and higher heights over the 
Arctic, which is why we keep sending these cold air intrusions south during this time of year. And like I said, the pattern is really not adjusting or moving too much over the next 10 days. We need to see what this means for the U.S. as we start to watch systems curl around that broader trough. A bit of just simple dynamics here. If the flow of the atmosphere is doing this, okay, what happens is as you come down off the ridge, you get convergence. Therefore, it's going to be drier here along the west coast. And then as you go from the base of the trough into the next ridge, right in through here, you get good upper level divergence. And that means the atmosphere is able to produce quite a bit of precipitation. So watch for systems to clip around the bottom side of this, but this will be the area that the models are going to continue to paint wet simply due to that upper level divergence in the flow of the jet stream. So if I look exclusively out to week two, notice how dry things are in the west. The flow comes into the trough and then exits like this, and that's why the models continue to put that in here. Now you notice I'm not showing you the GFS, and that's because the latest trends in the GFS has been backing themselves up to align better with the European model, which is why as we look at over the next couple of weeks, I'm favoring the European model. Now watch what these temperatures do. I'm just going to play this for you. This starts off here on uh, Wednesday, looking at max temperatures. We got our first shot of cooler air Thursday. It presses east through Friday and Saturday, and a second shot coming in Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, right out of that same area. The Canadian prairies through the high plains getting into the Great Plains and eventually into the Midwest here. During this time period, both the east and west coast will have better chances of being warmer than they will be uh, on being colder. But right in the center part of North America, cold air keeps diving down. Now watch what it does at our minimum temperatures. And I'll pause this to show you what I'm watching here. We're going to be seeing frost uh, temperatures below freezing in through this area on Thursday morning. As I get into Friday, look at the extent of our frost line down here. So this is now going to be clipping parts of Kansas, uh, North than half of Missouri, Illinois, and over in Indiana and Michigan. And as we go from there into Saturday, now we're bringing in pretty cold air here into the eastern Corn Belt in the Ohio River Valley. There'll be a brief warm-up Saturday back in the high plains, but then as you saw, the next reinforcing shot of air comes in Sunday. Here's Monday and Tuesday. So we're going to be watching that repeatedly coming out of that trough over the uh, central part of North America until the pattern does uh, evolve. From there, let's just take a look at the day 5 through 10 from the European model. Here's our main axis of cooler weather. So as that keeps reestablishing itself, remember we stay warm along the coast and at times because the trough lifts over the east into another ridge, we're going to see warmer conditions. But as we get out there to, to the uh, day 10 through 15, once again, we do see that this is going to be the preferred path of that cooler air. But once I, again, just as we said, uh, as, the, as the air turns and the flow of the jet stream back toward um, the north here, we'll warm up the east coast. One thing I'll just comment on, uh, the trend in the models uh, over the last day or so has actually been warmer than what it was showing inside that area through the next 15 days, but still it's going to be colder than average, which is what we want to point out. From here, let's look at the long range outlook for the next 30 days from the GFS, which is over on the left and the European on the right. And all I have to say about this right now is that when you look at the next 30 days, uh, the pattern we're going to be seeing over the next 10 days is dominating what you see here. Beyond about day 15, the models are too far spread out to use them to give us any sort of guidance. They're just going to show this pattern uh, until it breaks, and I don't think they're going to go do a good job on picking up on when that break will be. Same thing with precipitation. I tend to favor more what you see over here with the European model, given that it continues to back up that ridge. And so I think seeing wetter conditions here and then coming out of the trough there uh, is certainly in the car. Cards. And I'm just going to mention briefly some stuff about the tropics. Uh, when we look out into the longer range, it does appear that due to some movement in the MJO, we could favor better conditions coming out of the, maybe out of the Gulf, out of the Caribbean or the Western Atlantic as we get to the very end of the month of October. Just remember that our hurricane season goes through the month of November. Okay, this is what I want to do to give you my long range update for winter. I want you to know that we watch all of these features constantly to determine how they're going to affect uh, the weather across any part of the world. Just remember, weather is very connected, but it's also nonlinear in its behavior and chaotic. I'm not showing you here atmospheric angular momentum on this figure or sea ice. Just a quick reminder though, angular momentum, the higher the values, the more zonal the flow of the atmosphere is west to east. The lower its values, the more blocked it can tend to be. So we're going to watch that a lot this winter as well. Now here's a few important things. 
when it comes to North American weather, we're going to focus on our nearby oceans and in the Arctic. And just a couple of terms you're going to hear me say quite a bit this winter is something about the EPO. It's positive or negative phase. And just remember, when the EPO is positive, we tend to have a more relaxed and zonal flow. It's colder in Alaska. It's colder over Greenland. And much of the United States tends to have a more northerly jet stream and it's warmer. When it comes to the negative phase of the EPO, big ridges build into the Gulf of Alaska. Troughs dig into the central part of North America between the Hudson and Great Lakes. And we get these blasts of colder air and a very active pattern in the eastern part of the country. Now, one thing to note here, when you correlate the East Pacific Oscillation, which is just the change in the jet stream pattern, with El Nino or La Nina, remember this. La Nina, which we're going into now, favors the negative phase of the EPO. So that could be a more preferred phase as we go through this winter. But here's the most important thing. The EPO is really just a representation of what the jet stream is doing. That's all it's telling us. And therefore, we can't forecast the accurate position of the jet stream more than about 15 days in advance. So this is not a seasonal predictor. It's something we're just going to watch throughout the season. Here's another one, the North Atlantic Oscillation. You know, the North Atlantic Oscillation, when it's in positive phase, we tend to have zonal flow. We tend to be a bit warmer across the eastern part of the United States, and it's wet in Europe. But if the NAO goes negative and a big ridge builds right in through here, well, we tend to have big coastal storm systems in the east, and it tends to get very cold in the central part of the United States. Now, the relationship between, oops, I'm sorry, that should say NAO and the uh, El Nino region 3.4 is extremely weak, almost zero. So the North Atlantic is going to be playing kind of according to its own tune as we go throughout this winter. Another reminder, forecasting the behavior of the North Atlantic Oscillation uh, isn't possible beyond about 15 days or so, okay? Accurately forecasting is impossible. So it's a sub-seasonal thing here we're talking about. I do want to mention this, and I brought this up last week. When looking back over the last almost decade or so, eight out of our last 10 winters have favored the positive phase of the NAO, this one over here which is why most of our most recent winters have had late onset of colder weather. One of the big tricks to figuring out this December is to know, are we going to have yet another winter, this one right here where I put these lines, the lines go right through the middle of each winter for the last 10 years, okay? Are we going to have another winter here that's going to have a positive NAO start? That will be a question we're going to have to answer once we get through November and into December. We cannot, it is impossible to answer it right now. Remember this as well, when it comes to the position and strength of the polar vortex right here, strong polar vortexes or positive values of the Arctic Oscillation keep all the cold locked up here. It's when they split like this, which it did back in the end of January of 2019. You might remember this. This is one of my favorite videos. I had this young lady who took a pair of her favorite stretchy pants, soaked them in water. She then chucked them up uh, in minus 30 degree temperatures. And I believe she was in Minnesota and they're freezing here midair. And as they come down toward the snow, it's a fun video to watch because the pants just kind of perfectly stick the landing there. Remember, it's disruptions in the polar vortex that uh, really lead to these big cold Cold air outbreaks. Now, something to think about. I want to take you back to the winter of 2018 19 versus 2019 and 20. These are the kind of things you're going to see me present. Those winds way up here in the northerly latitudes, but high in the atmosphere, in the stratosphere, are what we watch. Whenever we see big drop offs like we saw here, that indicates a major weakening of the polar vortex. But what we watch for is just fluctuations. So even when it drops like this and goes right back up, it's the transition we're going to pay most close attention to. Last year, we saw an early drop off here and then a quick rise. And then it spent much of the rest of the winter with a very high values compared to average. It's too early to say what the polar vortex is going to do. But one thing I'm watching, which I've been telling you about, is the fact that right now our sea ice extent is second in the Arctic only to 2000. 12. And as the Chukchi Sea, which is here, fills in and the cooler water moves into the Bering Sea, that will be interesting to see if that impacts the position and strength of the polar vortex. One thing to note, since 2012 is a good analog for sea ice, 2012 and 2013, that winter, was a late onset winter that brought in massive cold air once we got into the end of February and through March. So just another piece here to be thinking about. It's not, it's just a single analog year, but I wanted to share that with you. One brief note about the MJO. Remember that once we get through winter, typically our colder phases are these over here, six, seven, eight, and one. Our warmer phases are two, three, four, and five. 
And uh, while we watch the MGO move, again, it's a sub-seasonal feature. It might give us an indication out two to three, maybe four weeks as to what might happen, but the correlations are not strong. In other words, they're not like 0.5 to 0.7. They're down there around that 0.2 to 0.3 range. And I'll keep you posted on what's going on there. So the big thing we have to talk about is La Nina. And this is a time series of El Nino and La Nina events. And you can pause the video and take a closer look at this. But here's what I want to do for you. You know, all throughout summer, getting into this winter, or excuse me, this fall, we've seen this La Nina get stronger and stronger. We know that our ocean temperatures right now are down there around minus one degree Celsius. And we can see that our trade winds right in through here are robust, a telltale sign of a strong La Nina. Notice that this La Nina doesn't extend up into the North Pacific. That's critical because it's a certain type of La Nina. So thinking about that and knowing that the models are forecasting it to stick around through much of early winter, they expect it to fade. Listen closely. They expect it to fade once we get past February back toward neutral conditions for next spring and summer. But right now through winter, we're going to be dealing with this. So if you just said, what does that mean for winter? Well, December through March, the flow of the jet stream will probably do something like this if El Nino dominates the background state. And that's a lot of cold air storing up here in North America with warmth and drier conditions along the south. From there, I want to show you some analysis that we were doing here. And several other people have been doing this. It's good analysis. These squiggly lines you're looking at, this is January to December every year since 1990. And each one of those squiggly lines shows you how the ocean temperatures in the central Pacific changed throughout the year. And that big dash line there is, um, is uh, 2020. Now, what I did next was I said, well, let's get rid of all of the years that don't look like 2020. And where are the ones that do? And this is what I got. So I then took those years and using La Nina as my only analog indicator. So remind you, I'm this is the only analog indicator. I built this. So it was these winters that you see right down here that the temperature patterns during them featured cold water in the North Pacific coming through, not, yeah, but cold water, but also cold air over Alaska that at times intruded into the United States here. A lot of clipper systems along the northern border. It was warm in the southwest and unfortunately dry, and that spread over toward the southeast. What did the jet stream do? It did this exactly. Ready? And we had these clippers that kept coming through the Northwest. They kept coming through the Northern part of the U S and each one gave us a shot at some colder air. While again, it was very dry and warm across the Southern part of the United States. So why tell you that? Well, here's our October pattern that more, the models are forecasting, but watch as I go from here into November, which currently the European says, Hey, keep the trough developing here, but warm across much of the United States compared to normal. But watch as we go from November to December, in January. Do you see it? The model's predicting another late onset winter at this point using only La Nina as its indicator. Big ridge here, just as exactly what we just saw a few moments ago, troughs cutting out of Alaska into the Northwest. And as it go from January into February and March, the ridging over the South and Southeast keeps things warmer and drier there, but a very active storm track through the middle part of the country. So what do we get? Wet here, wet in the Ohio River Valley as the jet stream does this drier in this corridor according to the latest European long range update. Now in the temperature map over here on the right, remember there is a long term warm bias in the model. So what I want you to see is that the cooler weather that you see will likely extend down into this whole region and we'll probably see warmer conditions along the southern part of the United States. That's the latest I've got for you and I'm trying to make some sense out of this model. I can also show you this. This is the December, January and February forecast from the NMME. Notice almost exact same things, right? Wet here, wet there, dry in this area. And it too has that same known warm bias. So what we got here is we got the cooler air coming in through here at times, clipper systems running along this area, but possibly an active storm track through the Ohio River Valley. I do expect this winter to be quite volatile. We have a La Nina brewing. And if it controls the background state, that means we're going to be seeing better chances at seeing these cold air intrusions at times. Warm in the south, dry in the south, but cooler along the northern tier of the U.S. What we cannot forecast is the EPO the AO, the NAO. We cannot forecast that long term, which is why this entire analog forecast plus the long range models I just showed you is based almost entirely on La Nina. And that's what's going to serve as my preliminary outlook. Thanks for giving me a little bit extra attention today. Hope you found this useful and informative. Look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Thanks.